All right. All right. So hello, everyone. So welcome to our first um, orientation for our part one, uh, for the part one exam. Um, so we are launching our course as well soon. Um, but again, whether you sign up for our courses or you don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, basically, it's just walking you through if you are preparing for this exam. Um, it, it, it's a good idea to understand how it works. Um, how should you prepare? What are the different elements for that? Um, understanding the marking structure um, is really, really important, just the way we do it for part two exam as well. Um, so going back uh, to about us. All right. So now um, my name is Nazili. Of course, I'm the founder of ADC Warriors. And I have been teaching for almost five years now. Um, so I have been, I started my journey with the communication OSCEs mainly because that was my strength. Um, coming back from UK, I was a registered dentist there. Um, and then in Australia, as they've launched a the new system, so I did notice there was a lot of gap. Of course, you know, um, you know, the courses here um, that were being offered, most of them were not um, delivered by trained um I mean, of course, um, it is about basically proper training program, just like they do it for their own uni. So that's really important. Um, so that's how my journey kicked off. Um, and then with the communication OSCEs, we extended to um, technicals last year. So we have set up our academy in Brisbane as well, where we see a teacher on site um, for the, um, technicals and skill as well. So pretty much we um, teach all the different elements for part two exam. As you can see, now our vision at ATC Warriors, of course, is to empower every individual. That is the core, that is the essence in everything that we do. Every mentor, every team members, um, they know about it, that if anybody um, signs up for our courses, uh, we ensure that um, uh, we guide you. At the end of the day, um, you're the one that is going to be sitting for the exam. So our job is to give you the toolkit so that you go in the exam very confident and you know how to do it. And again, it comes with clear understanding of the concepts, clear understanding of the marking system, all right? Um, so we, this is why we rely a lot more on um, the guidelines. Uh, we focus on concept building. This is why uh, when it comes to part two exam, we have one of the highest pass rate. I mean, last year as well, out of 200, we had about 145 people just from our ADC Warriors Academy family. And I'm hoping this year as well, already we haven't even hit the end of the year. I can see this year our results are going to be far better than what we had last year. So that is our aim. And that is the same standard that we are probably expanding it to for our part one program as well. Now, um, again, this is basically just some of the glimpses that we have been doing, not only uh, for the part two courses now with part one as well. We're going to be supporting with the questions uh, with different marks, focusing a lot more on the concept building, not only videos, live classes. Um, and of course, it's not that just we focus on the exam. Um, anybody um, that has been with us, they know that we will be by your side until the end, even if you've had your past your AD exam. We do have a very supportive ADC alumni support group where we extend our support uh, further with the registration process. We have been liaising with some other really incredible people um, uh, and we're collaborating with them to bring mentorship beyond ADC. Uh, we have collaborated uh, for accelerate licensing courses as well. So there's a lot that we've been doing and next year we have even more plans to extend our support. So that is just a little bit of background on who we are and what we do. Now, going back to part one. Now, um, this is a question that we often get asked for. Um, you know, we get receive email messages, you know, how should I apply for the exam? You know, what is the process? Um, so, I, I mean, if this is, if you haven't been through the initial assessment, so that would be your first step. So to be able to sit for the part one exam, um, you need to um, go through the initial assessment process where you need to pay a small fee to ADC, uh, where they're going to assess your qualification, they're going to assess, um, you know, your degree. And then um, after that, then they will um, send you confirmation email that you are ready to sit for the exam. 
Now, once you get the confirmation, then of course, um, you will be eligible, like ADC says, that have a valid initial assessment. Now, normally that initial assessment lasts for up to seven years. Sometimes, you know, um, after seven years, um, when that assessment ends, then um, we basically, um, you have to basically reapply for that. Now, have your identification documents uh, um, ready with them, all right? So this is basically what we do. Now, when it comes to part one exam, uh, basically, um, we're talking about scenario-based questions, all right? So we're doing, um, now previously, um, the way the exam was structured, it was very um, theoretical, um, because I remember I said the old pattern, where it was all about dental materials. It was very kind of bookish. Um, at times, I did find it very boring, uh, because you had to remember all the little details about the materials and different things. But with the new system that they brought um, back in September 2021, now I do find it quite interesting because the scenarios that they're giving us is uh, very clinical, which is the best thing about it. Now, um, so when we talk about scenario best format or SBQs, now it's good and bad in a sense that what they do is they're going to be basically giving you one scenario and um, each scenario will have questions underneath it. All right. Um, again, if you get the first question wrong, everything else will go with it. All right. So what they want to assess with these um, multiple choice questions is so you have to choose the best answer. Sometimes the answers can be quite conflicting. And this is why, again, we try to focus on the uh, on the concept, because um, the question bank that everybody has, including us, it is just coming from the candidate's memory. All right. Now, sometimes the information might not be there. Even one word into that scenario can completely change your answer. So this is why we try to focus a lot more on the concept building. Now, uh, going back to how the exam structure works and how is it being conducted. So a written exam is normally conducted twice a year. So one in March and the other one in September, pretty much every year. So I guess the September results would be coming out soon, probably early next week, as they are opening the enrollment for um, the next batch in for part two in January. Um, and then uh, what basically we're aiming for is to prepare for the March exam, which is coming up, which is probably five months from now. Now, in the exam, um, it is conducted over two days. So now for when it comes to part one exam, now, this is being conducted across different parts of the world. Um, you know, so you will you can go on to Pearson View. Pearson View is basically um, the one that conducts these exams. They have centers, you know, you might find three or four centers in India and in Pakistan and, in, you know, UK, Dubai. You know, there's a lot of countries. So that, that's the benefit of that, that you can easily give part one exam from the comfort of your home. You don't need to travel to any other place unless, of course, it's not being provided in your home country. But for part two, of course, you need to come to Australia. So that's the only issue with part two. Now, for part one, um, it's a two-day exam. So we're talking about day one where you have um 70 questions so in total they are giving us about 280 questions and they've divided into four sections so paper one paper two paper three paper four now it's going to be a mixture of different subjects we're going to be discussing about that as well in a short while and each paper will have about 70 questions now when you finish your paper one which is roughly about two hours then you get a break um, and then after the break you go back in and then you do the section two all right. And then again, the next day, um, same thing happens. Um, now, it is based on the computer. I think I should have the picture. So let me open up if I have the picture of um, that venue, Pearson View, so that I can show you. Anyways, until I find that, I'll show that later. So this is basically what ADC has told us they said there are about 280 questions across four sections and then um, there are about 56 scenarios uh, which are clinical and each one of them will ha have five questions and it needed all right so imagine you have 56 scenarios across two days 
And if I were to divide those 56 scenarios on each day, you will have 14 scenarios. So there is one big main question. And under that main question comes five sub questions. All right. So in total, 70 questions for each paper. All right. So that's about 140 per day. Now, um, ADC also says that when we look at those scenario-based questions, now about 240 of them are the ones that you will be scored, all right? So that means um, they are going to be basically assessing you um, on the, the marks, while the 40 of them, now we don't know which those questions are. You know, these are basically some pilot questions that they are testing it out. And then those ones, even if you mark, even if you mark it up, they are not going to score you. So about 240 of them. Now, oftentimes, if they were to introduce a new topic into the exam, sometimes they want to introduce something new to test where everybody is. So sometimes a very simple question as well to see what the level of these candidates are. Um, those questions are basically for them to assess. All right. So um, now also um, in terms of um, the clusters now, it's it's good that they have introduced clusters in uh, part one because this is something we always talk a lot about in cluster in part two exam because without understanding the requirement of the clusters it is impossible to do the exam all right so this is something that i find that people are not very clear about uh what is the requirement and if you look at it they have given a number of percentages as well how many questions would be coming from each cluster and at the same time, they have given us um, different subjects and then how much questions will be coming out of those subjects. So um, if I say that um, a cluster one, it is about professionalism, we're going to look at it. I mean, I'm going to show you, I'm going to break it down for you, what is included in those clusters. I'll give you a brief overview. Um, health promotion and professionalism comes in cluster one. Um, information gathering, which is about 30%, cluster two. Diagnosis, cluster three and um, treatment planning is cluster four. Now for part two, of course, we have three clusters only. Now we don't know when they give you, for example, one scenario has got five questions. Now um, you will have one question from cluster four, another question will be from cluster two, another cluster question will be from cluster one, all right? So you don't really know, but I'll show you how to look for those keywords, how would you be able to identify which cluster? Because at the end of the day, when they send you the results, they will tell you you failed cluster two or you failed cluster four. So they're not going to tell you, but at least, uh, you know, you would know that is my weakness. Maybe I did not understand that cluster really well. All right. So this is always going to, because I've seen so many people failing a certain cluster. And I do find for part one, majority of the time, people are failing cluster one, uh, cluster two, which is the information gathering. All right. So in terms of um, the subject, and this is how um, we have designed our courses as well. Um, I like to go subject wise. Now in the exam, there's no subject wise. You might find in one SPQ, you might find one question from perio, one question from oral medicine, one question from, you know, for example, um, a pharma. All right. But um, I do find it um, in order to practice putting those questions under one heading, under one subject makes it easier because then it would make it easier for you to pick up one book pick up the certain you know you're in the rhythm and you're kind of reading through it now most majority of the question that they said uh would be coming in the exam is from restorative dentistry of course you know we're talking about you know um, fixing the teeth you know saving the teeth so and that would also include the fixed orthodontics now 10 percent will be coming from pharma again that will be across uh, multiple domains you might find it across different questions oral medicine and pathology and general medicine will be about nine percent 8% of the questions that would come in the exam is from endodontics, pediatric, oral surgery, perio, and preventive dentistry. 7%, as you can see, the percentage is going down. Now, dental emergencies, pain, and behavior management is 7%. 6% is removal prosthodontics. All right. And then infection control, radiography, and implant. All right. Now, implant again and pharma. These are the two um, that will be assessed across different domains. All right. Uh, they will not be limited to one domain. And I did talk about domains. These are the domains that we talk about. All right. Now, how basically um, 
when we talk about the domains and what are basically covered. Now, you might hear a lot about competency. You know, they're saying we're testing the candidate's competency, you know. So, you know, that would make us quite curious to know what do they mean by competency. So basically what they are testing is not just your knowledge, uh, but your experience, your critical thinking. Now, I do find that critical thinking one of the most difficult thing, even for part two exam. Um, it requires extensive research because, you know, it's in the exam. One thing I really want you to be aware of is it's got nothing to do with your clinical experience now. I know, uh, you know, a lot of times we might think, all right, well, you know, um, you know, having an Australian, you know, registration working as a dentist might give you an edge. But believe me, we're talking about a gold standard benchmark. All right. Because the benchmark, because everybody will be practicing in their clinic in a different way. I mean, you might practice in a different way versus how I would do it. But what makes the correct marking? What is the correct benchmark, whether it comes to ethical decisions, whether it comes to, um, you know, what is the best way to go about with each case is. So that's where the competency comes in. This is where they will be uh, testing our knowledge, experience, critical thinking, problem solving, care, our professionalism, ethical and diagnostic and technical and procedural skills. Now, it is a very complex thing. It's not that simple, all right? It's not just reading, it's understanding it and putting it into application. And this is what I find very interesting with the new pattern that they've brought um, because uh, now it's more about your... Um, it's very clinical, I would say. All right. So going back, we did discuss about those domains. Now they're talking about these um, care systems. This is something that we use a lot more for part two, uh, where we talk about. So this is where at the heart that we call this is like the sun, the heart, the core, whether it's uh, part two communication OSCEs or whether it's part one. This is a person centered care. Now, what is a person centered care? This is basically. Um, taking information from a patient, your investigation, which is your cluster two, then it is basically how would you diagnose and manage the patient and then your treatment planning and evaluation. So that is right in the middle of it. Now, apart from that, they have also extended to health promotion and professionalism. So this is where health promotion is. This is where our professionalism is. Now for communication, leadership, critical thinking, again, these are the things that they will not assess you based on the clusters. This is something more important. Of course, this is something to do with our communication. We tend to talk a lot more for part two. But for now, part one, we're going to focus on these three areas basically, all right? And I think it's good for you. Once you understand these, believe me, if you master these in your written exam your part two is going to be a breeze you're going to find it very very easy all right so now when you talk about professionalism what does it mean you know what are the areas that they want us to um, cover so adc has given us some uh, some sort of um, um, criteria that they would be assessing and number one the main thing is always uh, patient's autonomy is going to be above everything which is what is the patient's choices patient I have to respect I have to keep the patient's you know um, decisions at at a priority making sure the care that I'm providing is holistic free making sure again for part two they're focusing a lot about um, you know the Torres Island Aboriginal community so and we do see some questions in part one as well and this is very important making sure we provide a culturally safe care now there are some questions in part one that will come under the ethical domains as well where we need to ensure that everybody has got their uh, own belief system everybody has their religious their you know their own views i have to respect that you know we cannot override those also making sure this is very important working within one's own ability and competency you'll find a lot of questions in part one where they would ask that, would you do this? Would you refer this patient, right? Now, those are very, that's where we're testing your critical thinking. Now, if you don't know your boundaries, now, again, um, I'm emphasizing this has got nothing to do with, you know, how we would practice back home. This has got nothing to do with the amount of years of experience we have as a clinician, whether overseas or in Australia. This is something we have to go back to the guidelines. Where where does good code of conduct have set my boundaries? So you have to be very clear whether it's peri or when, how far, 
those you know the pockets that we talk about when should I refer and when can I do this um, deep periodontal debridement you know so this has to be um, clear again practice in a very ethical and professional manner and of course making sure that we recognize the environment as well that is our responsibility so that's where the amalgam things come in and infection control now when it comes to health promotion, now what is something, and there's a lot of questions um, that will come under uh, preventive dentistry, basically health promotion. They say basically oh, with this, they've given us four um, criteria. They said this is they're going to assess us understanding the social determinants. You know, first thing I need to identify what are the risk factors or those behaviors that will influence the patient's health. And also knowing the connection between the those programs, health promotion and any policies that would develop, you know. so. Now, what are the topics that we would normally come under health promotion is basically oral hygiene, uh, making sure that um, patients die. Healthy choices are very important. And you do see that a lot of an issue with that, for example, you know, with high risk of caries uh, coming, high sugar content, or of course, in, um, you know, back in Aboriginal tourist community, we do hear a lot about, you know, not, not making healthy choices, loss of sugar leads to diabetes and so many other issues, right? Um, malnutrition, you know, again, can lead to after. So, so many problems, cancer that can happen. So, promoting that. Uh, fluorides, very important. Um, we need to promote the use of fluorides in different forms, toothpaste, warranties, you know, different products. Uh, making sure we discourage tobacco and e cigarettes. Now, vaping or e cigarettes are quite trendy. We do get a lot of questions in part two as well. Now, alcohol as well. And then eliciting drug, uh, you know, illicit drug, you know, any recreational drug if they're using, and trauma. This is where the mouth guard, and you will find a lot of questions about mouth guard as well in part one. All right, how do we prevent that? So that is basically, and I'll give you an example of the questions, what might come under this domain and how would you be able to pick that up, all right? This is just to give you an overview. Now, cluster two which is information gathering. Now, it is kind of weird because uh, in part two, we have three clusters, one, two, and three. And uh, cluster one for us in part two is information gathering, while cl cluster two is diagnosis. But here, you know, it's kind of different. So I'm just getting used to it. So cluster two in part one is information gathering. Now, these are the six points. Again, if you master this now, this is going to help you so much in part two as well, because these six points should be on your fingertips because this is what they expect from you. Now, wherever you come across questions where they are, it's about taking a history, sometimes you might find questions in part one where they say, well, you know, what question, what would be the first question you're going to ask the patient? You know, what is what investigation would you do in order to diagnose this condition? So anything to do with history, anything to do um, with examination, any clinical test, any lab test, any diagnostic special test that we would do, for example, you know, um, a crack finder uh, could be a special test to identify a crack tooth, you know, a CBCT, um, radiographs, you know, radiographs you would take, or evaluating the risk factors, for example, you know, why would this patient come with this problem, you know, and, uh, and that information will come from the history and making sure we have a very consistent, legible, contemporary records. Now, records is not just, um, you know, your investigation. Records is your history as well. You know, how do you take the history? What information do you need to put into the patient's notes? Um, what investigations you needed to do? Um, what basically, you know, provisional diagnosis and differentials you came up with, all right? And then that will go into the patient's notes. Now, um, that is... Um, the information gathering, like I said, majority of the people are failing cluster in part one. This is where the problem lies. And I do find that if you're not clear on those investigations, believe me, it's very tricky, very tricky. They play with words like um, what is the most um, important investigation? What is the least uh, likely investigations you might do? What is the best investigation for this the, the less likely most likely best least helpful those are the words that will tremendously impact now if you've memorized it and you have not understood it it's going to be very difficult all right now when it comes to cluster three sorry i need to change that cluster three so now cluster three which is the diagnosis cluster 
um, this is about basically, again, recognize the patient's health, which is basically, again, we do take a little bit of history um, in part two. But here again, knowing what the history, um, I would more focus so in the written exam where you find that you're giving a diagnosis. For example, when they give you a chemical scenario and they say, so what do you think could be the, the cause, you know, of this, for this problem, then know that you're dealing with a cluster three. And also the impact, if you see that, we're also talking about evaluating the risk factors in um, cluster two, basically. And then in cluster three, we're talking about determining the impact. All right. Now, when we talk about risk factors, we're talking about two types of risk factors. One that is um, will be diseases or the other ones that will be medications impacting the patient's health and the treatment planning. Now, uh, once you've identified the risk factors and how it would impact, then we will take make sure that, again, patient-centered care, treatment plan, your referrals, wherever you find yourself referring to another practitioner, know that it comes under cluster three because that's where the management comes. Now, management is a big word that we use. Management is basically you treating the patient and it's a, also taking advice or referring the patient to manage. Um, some of the other elements of their um, condition, all right? Sometimes it could be another GP, another specialist, your colleague, it could be, you know, somebody else, any allied health that is helping you um, is basically will come under this domain. And also your financial consent um, is, or informed consent is part of your cluster three. And when it comes to cluster four, we're talking about clinical treatment planning and evaluation. Now, basically, what this is about is about step-by-step -step in depth. Now, when you find questions where they're asking in depth about um, treatment options, for example, or, you know, details of those, you know, or your prescriptions, pharma, when you find them. Now, pharmaceutical could come if pharmaceutical, for example, if they say that um, certain medication, for example, diabetes, um, let um or any medication let's say i'm just thinking for example um ranch for example when we talk about bisphosphonate if patient they give you a scenario about that now it could come under the diagnosis of that medication or um, you know would be the reason why the patient ended up having a osteonecrosis but then there are other ones that will come here where you're going to be prescribing to the patient. So sometimes they ask what pain medications you would give, what antibiotics would you give? So wherever you're dealing with prescriptions, you're prescribing something, then you know that you're dealing with cluster four. Now, these are the key words that you should, and again, your replacement options. So again, surgical, non-surgical, so where you are extracting to doing an endodontic treatment, um, you know, when you're talking in depth about, you know, giving local anesthesia, that will all come under clinical treatment planning and evaluation. And you're also, your long-term restoring, you know, your fixed prosthesis, removable, that will all be part of this domain, all right? Implants will be all part of this. Your dental emergencies, medical emergencies, like I showed you these subjects, right? Uh, let me take you back. So these are the subjects that we talk about. But if you break it down, a lot of them, then you will know where it will go. For example, majority of the prosthodontists might fall into cluster four, all right? Dental emergencies will fall under four. Now, pain and behavior management will fall under cluster four, because if I take you back to point number two, apply the principles of behavior management, manage patients' anxiety, where you find patients are anxious and you're offering them sedation options will all come, back, come under this domain here, all right? So, of course, um, it's easier said than done, but this is what we're going to be focusing um, in our courses as well. Is Like I said, our vision is to empower every individual. Uh, our aim is that you understand the clusters, you identify it, and then you know every option. If it is correct, why is it correct? If it is wrong, why is it wrong? Because if they change the questions, if they change the wording, I don't want you to get shocked. And like this is what we do for part two as well. We we rely a lot more on concept building. All right. So um, if you have any questions up to this point, I'm happy to answer. If you want me to continue, we'll continue with that. All right, so scoring system, how they would be marking us in the exam, how that is done. 
Now, going back to the scoring system. So um, now the, again, whether it's part one and part two, this is really important because I, it's going to be very naive for me to go and sit out there. Oh, I'll just take this exam and just see how you go. No, no, no. You should know how you're being marked. So as we said that out of 280 questions, every um, each paper will have 14 SBQs and each SBQ will have so many questions. Now, we don't know where those 40 questions are. It could be paper one, paper two, three, four spread across. We don't know which questions are, but 40 of them will be unscored. It's just part of their training for them to assess, test it out. Um, and then 240 are the ones that are scored. But of course, you need to give your best shot. Now, when they would be sending you the results, so it's not that they're going to give you a number, unfortunately, and same thing for part two, they never give the numbers. So they say the scored questions are counted for each cluster and you must score above the passing standard. You see, now the passing rate will go up and down depending on how the people are performing on the day. This is something, you know, that we see for part two, but it will fluctuate. You know, there are certain months that we have very good results. There are certain months we have very bad results as well. It depends on demand and supply. Depends on how many people ADC has decided to pass. So now to pass the written exam, you must achieve a pass in each of the four written examination clusters. So even though it is going to be four papers, as you can see, they're not previously what they used to do is they used to tell us you failed, for example, paper two. You have to fail, you fail paper three. And we knew what would would be covered. We knew what subjects would be covered in paper one, two, and three. But now they changed it. Now you will find pretty much all the subjects in all the papers. It's not that you're going to go for the second paper and say, all right, I would expect just press to know you will find peace, oral surgery, everything. But what you need to pass is this. All right. And again, uh, we go back to the percentages of the questions that would come under each domain. So if I say um, cluster one is about 20%, 20% of the questions will belong to cluster one, 30% for cluster two, 30% for cluster three and 20%. So cluster one and cluster four is 20%, but these two, this is why I said, this is where people are failing. So going back to the marking system. So they said now for each cluster, you will be provided with a grade. Now, if you score grade A and B, that means you've done a good job, it's a pass. If you've scored grade C and D, that indicates a fail. That's pretty much what you're gonna get in your results. Now, the meanings of grade A to D are shown. Now, if they say you've scored grade A, that means it's a clear pass. Your score was more than 10% above the passing score. That means that when they said a borderline regression, they said, for example, anybody that scores 70% and above, all right, will pass. And you got 80%. So you did a good job, all right, clear pass. Now, Let's say um, it, your score was within 10%. For example, 70% was the pass rate, 70, and you scored 75, or you scored 71, or 72, or even 70. Now that's a close pass, all right? But if your score was within 10% below the pass score, now let's say it's 70 again, you got 69, that's a close fail, or 68 is a close fail. I wish we had those numbers. I wish they would send us to see where we are, but unfortunately that's, but that means you were within, you were very close to pass, you nearly missed it. But if you got a D, that means you are way off. If 70 was the pass, maybe you got 59, below 60, um, all right, or way below that, all right? So this is where you will, you will, it, you will see how far you need to push yourself, how far you need to work ahead in order to pass in the next exam. Now, they say there is not a set pass mark for the written exam or for a cluster because the pass mark is determined for each cluster by taking into consideration the difficulty of each question. This is why I'm saying those 40 unscored are basically, um, because this is something very similar pattern. What ADC has brought a system which is very similar to um, ORE. This is the exam that I gave in UK, which I passed in my first attempt. Um, and 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 there as well, you know, we didn't know which questions would be assessed, but that was basically bringing new questions for the next exam or also assessing where the candidates are and that was determined. So each cluster by taking into consideration the difficulty of each question used. Now, this September exam was tough um, from what I've heard. 
This is called test equating and allows the ADC to make sure that a pass in each cluster is determined by whether you meet a standard rather than by an arbitrary score. The standard used to set the pass mark of each cluster in each examination is equivalent level of the minimally competent reason. So they are testing us based on their um, graduate, you know, um, that is the benchmark, that the bare minimum we have to meet, regardless of how many ex years of experience you have. And I do find that generally, I mean, uh, from my experience, people who have less experience, clinical experience have more tendency to pass these exams, unfortunately, because this exam, like I said, um, is about standards, guideline. Now, what will happen, uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult because, you know, sometimes working for years in our practices, we might have developed certain practices, we might have certain biases, which might not be evidence-based, it's just based on my um, experience. Now, exam does not follow my experience, unfortunately, all right? So you need to really meet and understand the benchmark where they're marking you against. And then based on that, they're going to assess you, all right? So um, now, even if you fail one cluster, you unfortunately have to reset the entire exam, all right? So unfortunately, that's the way it is. Now, um, we're going to look at some sample questions, um, and then we can look at how best we can prepare for the exam. Or well, maybe I should get to... All right, so um, I'll just go to the recommended book list and I'll come back to the questions as well. Now, ADC has given us a list of books to read. Now, I really encourage you to read those books, all right, if you can, or the, the journals that ADC has recommended. Because, uh, look, the, if you start Googling, there's so many things that would pop up. And again, uh, you know, in Australia, you know, sometimes we follow Australian guidelines. Unfortunately, we don't have many Australian guidelines. So we're kind of going back and forth between UK and American guidelines. So what therapeutic guideline, one of the main book, which is our Bible, is therapeutic guideline. Now, that's a book that I really encourage you um, to start reading. That's one book that you will carry with yourself for the next, again, I don't know, because some people, they finish ADC exam in the same year, part one, part two, but for some, it takes years. But if you understand TG, if you memorize TG, it will save your life, all right? Everything in TG is uh, backed. Now, apart from that, for every subject, ADC has given us some um, reference books and they have even mentioned the edition. So please make sure when you're picking a book, you check the edition as well, because changing the edition, reading something old will change your impact, all right? So uh, endodontics, infection control, emergencies, do you see these books? Again, these are something that will be available all on our portal um, if you do sign up for our courses. So everything, and we have exactly kept the same editions. Now, some of you already know how finicky I am when it comes to the minute details when it comes to exam, because I believe it's all about details. It's all about paying attention to um, little things that makes a difference. So uh, for Cowson, I those are the books that I would pick up, right? Not any other book that I read in my undergrad, doesn't matter, all right? Because the questions probably would be coming out of these books. All right, so these are, again, something you will find it um, on their handbook. Um, again, you can buy a hard copy. I am more of a person in learning online. I find it easier to look for keywords. Now, um, how do we, how does it go in terms of um, the questions? All right, sorry, I'm just trying to bring it up. I'm just, this is just, again, an example. Uh, might not be, um, so from the Pearson view, all right. So this is Pearson view. Uh, they've given us a tutorial how it might look. Um, so what this is what we're trying to keep it as close as this. I mean, our website is still under, you know, hopefully um, we're hoping it to be ready by the end of this month. Sorry if it's taken us a bit of a while. But we because we are doing an extensive work, keep giving you a very realistic experience just like they would do here. Again, um, you might find that um, in the exam, the questions would be like this. For example, you find the questions here with the options and on the top, how much time is remaining. If you don't understand the question, you can flag it up. And then towards the end, you, for example, these, 
then you will see any questions that you did not understand or you flagged up. And I would always do that. For example, first round, the questions that you feel very confident about, you can um, do those questions first. And the ones that you're not sure about, flag it up. You can always go back to it. All right. So this is basically where it might look like. And then again, they do give you um, some time to practice how it works, like end review, review all, all right? So it's review the flag. Um, again, now sometimes what they do is, you know, um, because when we're talking about SPQs, we're talking about um, questions, all right? So what happens is in SPQs, as we said, you get one scenario. For example, this is a scenario. Now, this is the main question. So if remember, we said there are 14 scenarios in each paper. So let's say this is scenario number one. Now, you find the description sometimes with radiograph, sometimes, you know, with, um, you know, just a scenario. And then that will go here on this side. All right. Now, the questions, the SPQs, now each scenario will have five questions. Now, the questions would be here. And as you go click, these questions will change so that you can keep looking at the scenario and you go back and reflect. All right. Because those questions are related to that main scenario. Now, if you get that main scenario wrong, um, it's going to be very difficult. All right. So going back, sorry, where is that? All right. So going back to this scenario, now we say, um, let's look at this case and I'll show you how we're going to decode this and how you will identify the question. So I've used the same scenario that ADC has given in their handbook. So this is a case um, of um, patient Alexandra, a 64-year-old patient who's receiving warfarin as part of the management of his atrial fibrillation. And he tells you that one of his lower right back teeth was restored three years ago by a dentist who has since retired from your practice. Now, the tooth is uh, now occasionally sensitive to heart and call. The clinical notes confirm that the history, um, confirms the history and indicate that the tooth was restored using, so this tooth, as you can see, was restored with resin composite. Now, you've taken a periapical radiograph, and this is what you've taken, and you can see, look at that. The filling has been chipped off. There seems to be some decay underneath it, and this is the tooth that has been sensitive. Now it was done three years ago. Now, the first question, they say that now in addition to testing the pulp with either cold or an electric pulp tester, which of the following clinical test or procedures would you perform? Uh, would be, do you see there, they've used the word most appropriate. Now, these are the ones that are very tricky. These are the ones that will change the options. And even if ADC does not change the options, if you do not pay attention to that, it will become a completely new question. So what would be the most appropriate to assist in making a diagnosis? Now, they've given us a correct answer here. Of course, in the exam, you won't have that opportunity. So they've given options. And sometimes the questions will, be, will have very similar answers. You know, it's very hard to tell what is right, what is wrong. So they said the first option could be an OPG. The second one could be a bite wing. The third one could be a percussion test, a crack test, and an INR test. Now, um, what I like to do here is I normally, um, again, that's the same thing that I would do for a part two exam as well. I like to focus on the concept. So what we try to look at is if it's wrong, why it is wrong, if it's correct, why is it correct? for this particular scenario. Because of course with ADC, they have given us a complete scenario, but the one, the question bank that you might find it on Facebook on different platforms, including ours, these are all coming from the candidate's memory, you know? So now again, everybody might conceive it differently. So I do not 100% rely on those questions. I use those questions as a tool to identify the subject, to focus on that subject. I will take you in depth so the goal is that I save your time and then we look at those questions. So now they said that the keyword, they said here, the tooth is now occasionally sensitive to hot and cold. And then it confirms. Now, the only sensitivity to hot and cold. Now, if I would do a crack test on the tooth, if they give me any history of pain on biting, because when there is a crack on the tooth, patient will 
have a presenting complaint will be pain or binding. So that was not the case here. So that is out. Now they said that in addition to testing the pulp, which of the following will assess in making a diagnosis? Now, INR is something to do with my treatment. It is not going to help me with the diagnosis of this truth, right? So I will rule this out as well. Now, we go to the radiographs. Now, bite wings, if I were to take a bite wing, now, how is that going to help me? Because patient was very clear it's coming from this truth. If the patient was not sure if this is the top or the bottom jaw, yes, I would go for a bite wing, but it's not required. We know that it's this truth. OPG, again, is not going to help. It's good for a general overview, but I don't really need that. What am I left with this percussion test? Again, how do we go about that? Elimination technique. And second thing, we also, like I said, everything that I would be teaching is coming straight from the guideline. Like I said, I would put all the biases. We follow evidence-based dentistry, all right? And it requires an extensive amount of research. So my aim is to save your time because I know going through these guidelines is not easy. For me to solve one question, it takes me five hours. I'll be very honest about it. You know, uh, for the past couple of months, I've been waking 4 a.m. every single day trying to solve these questions, all right? So that's how much extensive, but this will help you because you get the summary of what I have researched. So going back, now what are the different ways we're going to be testing a truth? So we know about sensibility tests where we check the, response of the nerves inside the tooth like thermal we've got we check the heat where we check the cold depends on what the presenting complaint is so that is already done so then uh vitality we don't do that i mean it's very difficult to check the amount of blood flowing in the tooth but there are also mechanical tests that we do now what comes in a mechanical test is probing percussion and bite test again goes back to the presenting complaint. Now, probing, I would do it, for example, in perio cases, if I'm looking at a you know, fracture that is going deep below the gum line, it's incredible. Bite test again, where I, a patient gives me a history of that. But where's this percussion? Now, percussion, again, taking you back to Walton. So everything, like I said, I will give you a reference from where I've taken that from. So this is from Walton. So Walton says that percussion basically is a, is a way we're going to um, know about the inflammation around the tip of the tooth, all right? So if this is the tooth, now I don't know this part, if it's inflamed or not, because sometimes towards the late stages of um, irreversible pulpitis as well, we do see a little bit of tenderness here around the gums as well. So what do we do in um, percussion uh, is, if I take you back, so percussion test is done in three ways. One, you... Again, depends. If the tooth is extremely, extremely tender, what we tend to do is we um, gently touch it. For example, if you come across periodontal abscess cases, you don't want to tap that tooth. That person or patient will jump off the chair. That's what Walton says. All right? Um, I mean, sorry, tapping the tooth, we don't do that. So we touch the tooth. Um, or the other way we can do it, a bite test, you know, that you can ask the patient to bite on the cotton bud or your, your instrument and then see where the pain is coming from. So what sort of responses are we looking? If we get a, a very sharp pain response, then we know that there is a periapical inflammation, all right? So based on that, so we decided that it is the best option that we go for here is percussion test, all right? Now, if you can see that we try to explain each and every option based on the scenario, if they change this word, what is the least appropriate test? then you know which one would be, which would be INR. You know, I don't need an INR for diagnosis, all right? Just changing that will change the scenario and the question, all right? So this is very important, concepts. Then we go and look at the next question. So same scenario, now they've extended. Now going back, what cluster it was? It was cluster two. Remember it was investigations? Anything to do with investigation comes, and we said there's 30% of the questions coming from clinical information gathering. Now let's look at the next question and see what cluster it is. So it says in this case, what is the most likely to cause the failure of a class two composite restorations of a posterior teeth? Now, what could be the most likely uh, failure? So they've given us a few options. They said materials that are placed in increments because of the risk of leakage between the increments, glass anomal lining used because of the risk that the lining will leach out, Occlusal loads were applied to the marginal ridge due to flexure, 
extended curing time due to gradual shrinkage of the material, and gingival margin on dentine because of bonding under these conditions is unpredictable. Now, they said that what could be the most likely cause to, uh, of the failure? Now, what are we still talking about? What could be um, the reason why this feeling has failed? Remember, we spoke about in diagnosis and management, we said you need to determine the impact of the risk factors all right, on the oral health and the treatment plan. So the risk factors could have been in this case. Um, now, going back to see why this was a correct answer, why it wasn't a correct answer. So if I take you to my next slide. Now, we know that with, when it comes to composite, again, this is basically from Mountain Hume. So Mountain Hume says that, um, of course, you know, composite uh, restorations are really amazing in a sense that it gives us better aesthetics, you know. But however, you know, the, those posterior restorations, they do tend to fail. And you do end up repairing or replacing them a lot more compared to the front ones. Now, and and sometimes it's got to do with the shrinkage, all right? The total shrinkage could open an enamel margin, particularly in the gingival portion. And that's what they said. If you look at that, it happened around the gingival gums here. Now, why is that an issue? Why is failing here? Because when it comes to around the gingival, this is where we have... Um, you know, problems with moisture, which is very challenging, you know, because you have this, you know, fluids, you know, um, the gingival fluids, you've got, you know, blood. Um, and you know that one of the biggest um, thing that is important for us uh, when it comes to composite is um, a good, beautiful sealed moisture control is above everything. So the total shrinkage could open an enamel margin, particularly in the gingival portion of a deep proximal box where there may be little or no enamel remaining. And, and not only, you know, there's chances of hypersensitivity, but there could be secondary decay as well that can happen. And also there's another reference from Mountain Hume. They say that while not apparent at the time, when you etch um, the areas, all right, um, we do remove the dentine smear layer, we open those tubules. And then um, in order to prevent the polymerization, you know, we try to put composite in small in increments so that we can, if you put a big chunk, it will shrink a lot. So we try to do it in increments, but that shrinkage can still happen. And depending on how much it can create gaps between the filling and the dentine, because with the enamel, it's different. And with the enamel, there's a micromechanical retention, but with dentine is different. Now the gaps may fill with dentinal fluid, you know, and over a period of time, decay can happen around that area. So keeping that in mind, if we go back and say, so they said the materials that are placed in increment um, because of the risk of leakage. Now, that is what we normally do. This is the correct way. This is not the problem. Two, GIC lining are, are used because of the risk. I will reach out. No, we, we do prefer putting a lining, especially when the filling is very close to the pulp, where um, you know we place a layer to protect the nerves and the pulp, and then on top we put um, uh, composite. Occlusal loads apply to the marginal ridge. Of course, you know, occlusal load, they do contribute to those failures. Um, but again, generally, now that we have more better composites, you know, they're coming with, you know, really good strength as well. So it might not be the major reason. Extended curing time due to greater shrinkage. Again, um, when it comes to curing time as well, it is not directly related with greater shrinkage. And instead, the, the concern is... Um, it shrinkage is more so to do with inadequate lining, all right? Inadequate curing, basically, that leads to polymerization shrinkage. So what are we left with is gingival margin and dentine because bonding under these conditions are um, really not effective, all right? So going back to the next question that they said, now, again, if you look back to so what cluster would it come under, that's a cluster three diagnosis, all right? So then we look at now question number four which is basically then extending, given the history and radiographic evidence, what is the best description of the sensitivity to hot and cold you would expect um, Alexandra to report? Now, I mean, hot and cold, when you see that, you know, most likely we're dealing with, I mean, hot and cold can happen in reversible pulpitis. It can happen in irreversible pulpitis as well. Now, they said, given the history, now the best description why it might be having, so it could be a sharp, occurring once or twice per week with only ice creams and hot coffee, sharp and relieved on removal of hot or cold stimulus, dull and lingering, always present, worse in the morning, right? So again, if you go back here, 
they said the tooth is now occasionally sensitive and it confirms and you can see that look at how close it is to that area how close and again x-ray is just a small depiction once you start digging into the tooth you'll see it sometimes extending great great into that all right. So, um, but what again, given the history and what is the best description of the sensitivity to hot and cold you would expect for him is basically this will determine the lingering pain because hot and cold, you'll see it in reversible pulpitis as well. Now, we do see a lot of issues. Um, let me open that up. We do see a lot of issues. Uh, Oh, it doesn't work. Anyways, um, with um, a diagnosis, people, they still struggle to differentiate between reversible and irreversible. One of the major, major differentiating point is this. This is basically, again, from NPS website. So it says here, pain that ex exacerbated by thermal or um, hot stimuli, again, sharp shooting pain is reversible. Dull throbbing pain is irreversible for bias. All right. And then, of course, the last question that we come down to is, now you've decided to extract the tooth and I think that was the fourth question. And planning, you find that the patient's international INR is 2.4. What is the most appropriate action? So now it's to do with treatment planning, all right? So you've decided to extract the tooth. Now, what would be the most, again, this is basically um, trying to see how we're gonna uh, go with that. So proceed with the extraction and provide appropriate care proceed with the extraction so there's a couple of options but again patient got an INR 2.4 so if we look back at therapeutic guideline therapeutic guideline says anybody that did INR within 24 hours as long as within 3.5 or less it's safe for us to proceed and get the tooth out so they said proceed with the extraction yes proceed with extraction and suggest that the patient stop their medication no we would never stop the medication unless it's advised by the doctor there's no need for it Suggest that patients stop their warfarin and commence taking aspirin. No. Um, consult their cardiologist to discuss. Now, warfarin is hardly stopped unless there is some major risk of bleeding. Um, and usually those surgeries are planned. No. Again, referral to consultant. So if you look back at... Where is that? So I'm going to open that up. Um, so if you look back at therapeutic guideline... Um, so therapeutic guideline is talking about there are patient-related risk factors where basically um, there are um, certain conditions that will increase the risk of patient bleeding and there are procedure-related risk factors depending on what sort of procedure you're doing. Even a small extraction, one to three, has low risk. Subgingival debridement has low risk. So it's only if we have, um, like therapeutic guideline says, you refer to a specialist if the patient has patient-related bleeding risk factors, or if it's procedure related, but it's a high risk, which is this one. For example, biopsies, extensive, any procedure that requires flab extraction of a large number of teeth. So we were not doing any of that here. All right. So for that reason, no, that is not correct. And then the last question, which would be, um, this is part of our ethical uh, professionalism domain. So this is where they say, now that you've removed four six, which prosthodontic options would be the most appropriate for him, for the patient? So one is that we go for an immediate placement, an immediate restoration with a dental implant, replacement with an immediate removal of denture, replacement uh, with removal of partial denture after the extraction, replacement of a fixed bridge, and no replacement until the patient has had an opportunity to assess their functional anesthetic concerns. Now, you might be surprised they've used the word that they've ex they've chosen this one as the correct answer. Now, oftentimes, you know, coming from um, our countries, you know, we're kind of very enthusiastic. We always try to do things for the patient. But when it comes to ethical situation, one of the most guiding principles that we have is autonomy. Now, we're talking about four uh, major principles when it comes to ethical questions one of them is autonomy which is always going to be but is autonomy it is the patient's right to make their own decision so we at at no point will override that number two is non-maleficence which is not causing not do no harm that is at the core at the essence of every decisions that we're going to be making do no harm three justice you know it's making sure that you know sometimes certain decisions that we would take for the patient it might have consequences like you know unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions you know we just give antibiotics like giving m&ms to anybody right oh just i felt like giving antibiotic 
Well, how many times, you know, we've read about it. We're saying that by 2050, half of the world population will die because of antibiotic resistance. And already we're starting to see people dying because none of the antibiotics are working for them. So this is where the antibiotic stewardship is coming. All right. And the number four thing is beneficence, which is what will benefit this patient the most. Now, this is where I find these questions are the hardest one to answer in the exam because a lot of, you know, questions like, you know, best investigations, these two, you can easily get those answers for the, uh, from the books. But when it comes to the ethical questions, honestly, it's very hard to find these answers, all right? You will find that there could be two or three options that are so close to each other and you're kind of juggling between them. So this is where you see that cluster one will fall under. All right, as well, you have to be very careful with that. Now, so kind of going back to this case, why would it come under this domain? I mean, this was supposed to be under cluster three, no, cluster four, sorry. I mean, we're talking about replacement options here, which is perfectly fine, but yet, uh, we fail to understand that when we talk about patient-centered care, of course, you know, my colleague, um, if you can look at that, five years ago, my colleague did a filling and that filling, um, uh, three years ago, that filling failed. Sorry, let me restart this. Is... So that filling um, failed. Now this patient is back again after three years and... Um, I have decided to remove the tooth. Now, if I'm going to hand this patient another, uh, you know, set of replacement options, you know, you know, that patient might think, and we do see a lot of questions in part two as well, where they get upset. They say, oh, I came for one treatment and now you're trying to rip me off. You're trying to make more money out of it. So um, now let's look at the options and look at why it's not good. So if we um, look at option number one, which is immediate replacement of that um, tooth. Now, um, immediate replacement and immediate restoration, which could be a good option, but think about it. We spoke about it. Patient was an INR girlfriend now. I can't do that, all right? Uh, because um, I have to keep that in mind. And again, INR uh, implant is a major surgical procedure where there will be higher risk of bleeding. All right. And I don't, um, so we wouldn't be able to go for that. Now, replacement with an immediate removal denture again, yes, it short term, it would be very good in terms of, you know, of, um, affecting the improving the aesthetic and the function. But not only sometimes some people find it very uncomfortable, but sometimes, you know, um, it might impact when you put those clasps on those teeth as well, it might compromise those teeth down the line as well. And again, it's fairly expensive as well. You know, for the patient to pay immediate dentures, we're looking about $800 or something. Now, replacement with the removal partial denture after the extraction side has healed. Um, again, that's an option that will uh, we can do it after a week where we can give this patient. But it again, um, patient will not have any tooth there again, and patient might not like it. And again, it's expensive, extra cost. Sometimes they might end up going for something that is more better, which is fixed. Um, the dentures at the end of the day are quite uh, damaging to the gums and the bone. Now, replacement with a fixed bridge, that is something that I, if I were to do a treatment, I would incline more towards that because this is something that will give us a permanent solution, more comfortable for the patient compared to the removal options that we have. Um, but but the issue with that is, of course, you know, the cost, we're talking about, you know, fixed bridge, which is about three unit bridge, which is about 4,500. Think about it. This patient just came with a sensitivity of hot, hot and cold. We ended up removing that tooth. And now all these replacement options that we're talking about are fairly expensive. Would the patient need some time to think, right? Now, this is what makes it so important. This is where we have to think about, this is from one of the uh, BDJ articles. It says, the approach has to be different. So we're talking about coming from authoritative and coming from the patient's perspective. So now normally uh, coming from an authority, you know, we like to assume things. We feel like our patients have really impaired perspective. So we try to persuade them for things. We try to, we think that the patient lacks an insight. So whatever I say is correct, you know, practitioner instructs the patient, but that's the way it is. This is how we're gonna go from here. But when it comes to autonomy, I would let the patient lead. Again, um, taking you back to one of my ethical slides here. 
Okay, so um, taking you back to my ethical slides. Sorry, it's just my computer. I never shut it down, so I was have a problem with that. Anyway, it's not working. I'll bring this one here. So when it comes to the ethical decisions, we're talking about a set of uh, framework, a uh, set of questions that have been uh, accepted that we think is morally correct. And again, uh, at the end of the day, you know, we want to ensure that the patient receives the right care. Um, you know, we want, we know that um, patient is the essence it is. So any question that you come across in the exam, first thing you want to ask yourself is, is that needed? Is it for you? You think is important? Does the patient want it? Is it because there is some financial pressure from your end? You need to pay your bills. Does the patient, can the patient af afford it? Now, if I do go for that option, will that uh, improve the patient's, uh, you know, lifestyle or patient's, you know, uh, you know, perspective? Um, if basically, you know, you, those are the set of questions that you might have to ask yourself. And then you give it a thought and say, what would be the best option for this patient at this point of time? So we are making decisions as we go, the decisions could change tomorrow, it could change next week, but oftentimes the patient is here in my care right now, what would be the best one that I go? So when we're discussing the treatment options with the patient and when the advice is that we give, uh, so always make sure there's enough alternatives, you're satisfied that what is being proposed is within your ability, is in the best interest of the patient and that is what you want for yourself as well. Now, going back to this question here, Right. So if, uh, you know, if it wasn't that the patient wished, if they had used a word that the patient now once is looking for replacement options, that one word could mean I would have gone straight from which now patient is willing to go for something. But it says that after the removal, now which option would be the most appropriate? All right. This is from my perspective, keeping patient's autonomy in mind. So there is no need, there is no replacement until the patient has had an opportunity to assess their functional and aesthetic concerns, all right? Give the patient time to think over it. Of course, you know, there will be slight drifting if it's left for too long, but I would give the patient, they've used the word, patient has the opportunity to assess. That means give them a bit of space and time, let them think over it so that they can then see if it's impacting the aesthetic or the functions in any way. So that is why this answer is correct, okay? So this is the area that you find it quite tricky in the exam. These are the questions that is very hard to find the answers from the books, all right? So basically, this is what we talk about uh, part one. Now, part one um, has got very vast number of questions, of course. Now, as part of our course that we are basically bringing out, this is what we're basically, so we are going to be providing an e-learning platform just like we have for our part two, where we have the questions, we will have the videos, we will have once a week live classes as well, and we have the support groups as well where we're going to go through your questions, any doubts that you have, we're going to answer those questions. And again, anything that we teach, we say all coming from the guidelines. All right, so any questions if you have for me, I'm happy to take. Any questions do you have for me? Uh, Nazi, I have a one question, like in the September exam, how, how was the exam? Is it similar to the part two? Because I have to start my part one again, if you remember, I'm your part two student, Anshul. Yeah, yeah, Angela, I know you. Well, see, um, September exam was tough. I'll be very honest. Believe me, there we have such a vast number of topics when it comes to September um, part one exam. We have a lot of questions about dentures this time. We don't have that in part two. All right. Okay. There was there was questions. I mean, in March we had a lot of questions about mouth guards, different types of mouth guards, a lot of questions about auto, but in September we had dentures mostly. Then mm -hmm. we had questions about muscles, you know. Um, so th there were some some tricky questions for sure. All right. Okay. 
um okay. but you need believe me like i said if you want to prepare for part two exam if you're doing it on your own you need to invest a lot of time i mean personally myself every question takes me five to six hours okay yeah i got you yeah so you have to go through books and books and books to be able mm -hmm. to understand those questions all right thank you nazia and when you are starting the course we're starting probably from the end of this month. I mean, the aim was the beginning of uh, the middle of October, but because of my work, my IT, we had to push it a little bit further. But either way, the aim that the aim of this course is that we save your time. So just like you've seen for part two, I give all the answers. Everything's back with the guidelines. So same thing with the part one, like I showed you. Mm -hmm. Every question has got an answer coming from the references the books ADC has recommended. So that if you have time to read good even if you don't have time to read you know exactly where to go to because okay. i will always explain where i've taken it from mm -hmm. and then i'll explain the concept behind it and it is a portal so on the website the questions will be all on the website so what i've done is divided it subject wise so for example if module one is going to be pediatric dentistry so you'll find all the period, what I've done is I've taken all the questions from September, from March, from last year. So we have all the questions that have been coming in the last three, two to three years. And I have divided it subject-wise. So in PEDS, you'll find all the questions from those past papers. And then you go through those questions one by one. You'll see the answers. And then towards the end of the module, of course, there's going to be a quiz to see if you've understood it or not. If you need to go back and recheck it again and again. At the end of the each week, there's going to be a live class discussions about the questions. So oh, right. eight, yeah. we prepare you guys in two months, two to three months. That is the aim. Um, and the last one is just doing mocks pretty much. Thank right. you, Nazia. No worries. So that's about it.